Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Avanti Insights. I'm Adrian, along with Chris and Daniel, who I'm normally joined with our usual cast of characters. Guys, we are smack dab in the middle of Cybersecurity Awareness Month here in the United States. October, every year, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. You guys were sharing with me offline that when October rolls around, you're thinking, oh, man, I need to swap my credit cards out. And that made us think today would be a great day to talk about just kind of personal tips, and we'll get into some travel tips as well as the holidays are right around the corner and some travel bans are lifting. But let's start with this credit card piece. You both make a regular habit when October rolls around to swap and rotate your credit cards. Daniel, let's start with you. Tell us a little more about how you handle that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, d- d- depending on the card, I-, I typically rotate my cards either every every year, every six months. It's very easy. I take out a little bit of cash. I call the card company and say, hey, w- want to want to cancel this card and get a new one. And that's worked out really well for me. You know, there's a lot of services and websites that we use just, just one time or once a year, and then they save the card, right? And I can't tell you the number of times that I've, I've been saved here where I've canceled the card recently, a month or two later, that same service where I, I use the card will tell me they, they had a, a breach, right? They'll tell me to go and change my card and offer me all this identity protection. But, you know, I'm, I'm largely unaffected because I've already rotated my card. Chris, how about you? You're, you're pretty much kind of following the same model, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. No matter where you are in the world. No matter if you're traveling, no matter if you're just uh, you know a homebody, uh, you're using your credit card online. You're using your credit card in a variety of different retailers, fast food places, restaurants, anything else. You have no control over which one of those are going to end up getting uh, involved in a, a credit card breach or skimmer was being used at a gas pump or in a, a retail shop. Being able to cycle out your card and and all it takes is really just changing uh, the date and the CVV on those. That's typically enough to make it so that it'd be very hard to duplicate that card if it were compromised in a part of a, a cybersecurity breach. But doing that, you know, to Daniel's point, I've I've definitely had the same thing happen where within a couple of months of that, you see that your credit card had been stolen. You're already secure. You don't have to take any action. So you can plan for those events to happen because when you do that yes you're going to have to go to amazon you're going to have to go to all the places where you are using your card regularly you're going to have to update that and you can plan for it and you can get all those things changed over very quickly rather than have it be a reactive situation when something is inevitably going to happen so i'm a huge fan of doing that i've been doing it for years and like daniel a year is probably the most that i ever typically wait for that and I've been covered fairly well for several years. At the end of our last episode, I did mention my my summer vacation with the family this year. I did end up having a card be compromised in under a year for the first time in a long time. But a year is a pretty good mark. Well, I'll tell you guys, you guys have sold me to be more proactive, especially thinking about this during Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I can tell you, I have a number of credit cards like we all do, but my American Express card in particular, twice in the last year had been breached. So I've had to change it twice you know, and that wasn't even proactive. I had to after being notified and then having to have to go through the whole hassle of saying, no, 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 no. I didn't make that charge. And in essence, defend myself to American Express. So I like what you're saying. That proactivity, I think, uh, could help me down the road. That card in particular just seems seems to be cursed on my end uh, for, for one reason or another. All right. What else? And when you think of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, just thinking of personal tips, how you guys, what you guys may do a little differently or or as part of your monthly cycle or your annual cycle when this month rolls around, what else outside of credit cards may you each personally do? Yeah. So so just to kind of continue on the theme of, of credit cards, just for a, a second longer, one of the things that I do is is call the card companies and modify uh, my my upper limit for fraud. It's very very rare that I'm spending large amounts on on my 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 debit card or my credit card, and so reducing it to you know a couple hundred dollars so that I can buy like a big grocery order or, or an electronic at Best Buy um, is normally enough for me. But most cards have default limits somewhere around a thousand fifteen hundred dollars, and let's face it, we're not making those those kind of purchases on a daily basis. So reducing that a little bit actually goes a, a long way 
to help reduce potential fraud against your account. A, a couple other things I just do in my daily life as much as possible, I, I am moving to to paperless alerts. You know, every time you get a, a bank statement or some kind of a bill that does potentially expose you, if someone to, was to steal your mail, they can get an incredible amount of data for, for the things that I can't go paperless on. I have a micro um, shredder and I, I shred anything that has sensitive information. Dumpster diving is still an incredible source of personal information. You know, going and, and shredding the mail every once in a while actually kind of feels good sometimes, if we're to be honest. <laughs> It's almost like a weight is being lifted, right? In in that way. That's exactly it. I I had someone once advocate that, oh, but you know what? I'm not I'm not shredding this, but I'm ripping it up a little bit, but it's still you know, still decent size piece of paper from their bills, their credit card bills and what have you. But they're putting it into recycling and saying, well, people aren't really diving into recycling because it's going to be recycled. Can you guys speak to that? Is that? Does that make any difference, recycle versus dumpster? One thing that happens is uh, human behavior in general is something that threat actors will pay attention to. If you had the idea, chances are a whole lot of other people had the idea. (laughs) That's not going to be a deterrent in that case. For those of you who don't want to buy a shredder, another way to do that is if you have a fire pit, guess what your kindling is? Roll up a few bills and, uh, you know, start your your fire pit with that or occasionally have just like a a little mini bonfire in your fire pit and, uh, you know, catch up on on your burning as well. So there's there's a variety of ways you can do that. But I do the same thing. Anything that's, um, you know, go paperless wherever possible and anything that you still do get on paper, burn those or shred them and dispose of them properly because, yeah, even a little bit of information off of there could be enough for somebody to get enough about your identity. Adrian, I'll, I'll be honest with you. We, we had a, a paper only disposal at an organization I used to work for, and um, we, we stole the entire bin. And, and some of it was ripped apart. It wasn't hard to put it back together. But honestly, it was, it was nicer than dumpster diving because the smell was a whole lot better with the recycling. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'll be honest, it's actually easier to put those things together because there isn't as, as much other gunk there. So yeah, the, the recycling is not a, not a go. Oh, so what you're saying is that, that that's a, if you're going to go dumpster diving, that's a cleaner path. That's a cleaner, cleaner way to go. That ma- actually makes sense. Exactly I'm going to forward it. this podcast onto my friend after this, after, after we get this episode edited. All right, guys. Um, all right, let's transition to travel because uh, a couple, a couple things in the news recently, or just in the last couple of days. So the Biden administration here in the U S they're lifting the ban on, uh, for fully vaccinated people starting in November to come across both the Mexican and Canadian borders, and then also lifting air travel restrictions from 33 countries for those who are fully vaccinated. So slowly and booster shots are right around the corner for folks. In fact, it's already started in some area, some regions. So slowly but surely, the world is really starting to open up. We all have traveled a little bit recently. So um, people are, are they're hitting the airports, uh, starting to see uh, the crowds get bigger and bigger in the airports. People are starting to take flight. Holidays are right around the corner. What should we keep in mind? As people look to get back to traveling, especially air travel, what should we keep in mind from a cybersecurity perspective, Chris? Oh, let's talk about devices a little bit first. So basic cyber hygiene is important for all of your devices. You may be traveling with phones, tablets, laptops, whatever it is that you're bringing along with you. Think about, is your device up to date? Do you have a strong uh, passcode or biometrics in use on those devices? Have your, especially for the traditional like laptops and desktop uh, or laptops, uh, especially, have you updated those? It's uh, not uncommon for updates to be a little bit behind for people's personal devices. So this last patch Tuesday, October patch Tuesday, there was a zero day on the Windows platform and on the iOS platform. So, you know, it doesn't matter what platform you're on, what type of device you have. All of these devices have vulnerabilities that regularly need to be updated. So before you go traveling, and in general, you want to just do this regularly, make sure your devices are up to date. I had a really good question from somebody on on our Patch Tuesday webinar earlier this month. They said, or they asked the question around the iOS update. 
if I'm on 14, the iOS 14 version, am I vulnerable? Well, Apple hasn't been very forthcoming and they're usually very closed mouth about it. So most likely you are, but they only released the 15.x version. Another thing you want to do is try to keep up with the upgrades to the latest branch of whatever device you're on to. If you're still on 14 or 12 for your iOS devices, it is best to get up to the 15 branch and keep up to date with your updates there as well. They're going to be maintained better and more quickly. Uh, so vulnerabilities are, are a big thing, but securing your devices is something you want to look into before you go traveling. One of the things, you know, as a, a general practice I do uh, around Wi-Fi security is, is to make sure that um, I'm not always connecting back to the network. So there's there's always this checkbox on, on, on your devices that says automatically reconnect. And I always uncheck that. Uh, what can happen w- when you actually get out in the world is someone can spoof that SSID, that, that access point that you're using and say, well, yes, of course I'm your house. Oh, well, no, you're not. I'm, I'm out at the airport. I'm at Starbucks. I'm at the hotel. And so you're, you're actually connecting to a, a rogue device that's trying to pretend to be you, uh, or, or at a point that you've actually, uh, accessed before. And that opens up to a man in the middle attack. So they can actually sniff all the traffic that you're sending, uh, w- whether that's email or accessing your bank and, and, anything else. So that's always something that I do as a a daily thing. It's a little bit of a hassle, but it it makes a big difference. Other things that I I kind of prep for, there there are certain things that I always pack to to go with me before I leave. One of those key things is a little Wi-Fi router. It's probably about 60 bucks. It plugs directly into whatever the the point is in the hotel that I, I have to go to. And so instead of connecting to the hotel, Wi-Fi, I'm, I'm connecting to a known trusted device that, that I set up that I know the password for and nobody else does. And I'm not really sharing that connection with anyone. And a lot of these devices already have the ability to, to hook up uh, VPN tunnels on them. So you don't have to actually connect to the VPN anymore. It's already establishing a, a trusted VPN connection for you. So um, that's that's something I always pack with me uh, if I'm if I'm ever going to be in a in a hotel room. Uh, how about if you have your cell phone with you? And I want to talk about kind of bringing a second phone along in a minute. But you have your cell phone with you, and you have hotspot capability. How secure are you if you use that hotspot instead of say connecting to a hotel Wi-Fi or an airport Wi-Fi? Yeah. So always best to connect up to a network that you uh, know and uh, trust a bit more. So your cellular provider, that your cellular data is always the best way to go when you're traveling. When you start connecting up to Wi-Fi in any location, whether it's the hotel, a coffee shop, at the airport, the, the risk goes up significantly. So if at all possible, keep your cell phone to using your data plan uh, rather than connecting up to Wi-Fi. I, yeah, I know it, it gets challenging. I, I made the decision to connect my whole family up to an unlimited data plan. And boy, am I glad I did because I looked at how much my kids stream over YouTube. Oh, my bill would have been nuts. But it really does keep you a lot more secure. So that is one thing that's really important there. If you do have to connect up to Wi-Fi, as Daniel mentioned, having a device that can separate you from that risk, you know, one of those little Wi-Fi, you know, secure routers that you can plug in in your hotel room and connect through, that gives you a buffer between your devices and the kind of the wild uh, open uh, network of whoever else might be connecting up from the same location you're at. So those are a couple of things that definitely are, are good tips when you're traveling. Daniel, when you're traveling, I think I heard you say uh, offline that you will not always bring your corporate laptop with you. You will also bring a second phone, what some people might call a burner phone, to ensure you keep people attackers at bay away from your core stuff. Tell us a little more about that and how you how you approach that and why. Yeah, and, and so I'll start by saying it, it always depends a, a little bit on on your personal risk, right? For for me, um, w- when I'm traveling, I, I have to consider that I, I am the security person in, in, in an organization. That that if I'm traveling to conferences, um, you know, where where other security or or, or technology folks are going to meet, that's an excellent place for a threat actor to stage a what's called a watering hole attack. You basically 
know that all of your potential targets are in one spot. And so rather than fishing them individually, they kind of come to you, right? And and so when I when I consider where I'm going and, and what I'm doing, I, I may consider to bring uh, another device, typically a Chromebook. I, I have a Chromebook that I specifically use for travel. Um, and when I'm done, I, I wipe it back to firmware uh, defaults and, and upgrade it back up again. It doesn't take a lot of time t- to do it. And it's it's a, a small price to pay to, to make sure that I'm not putting the organization at risk. If I'm visiting some of the the cyber risky countries over over in the other side of the world, I also bring a burner phone. One of the things that's really helpful about that is just having a SIM card that is right for those networks. But also I, I don't need to do all of the internet browsing and such that that I may have to when I'm doing regular work in the States. So I have a burner flip phone. I get a SIM card that's local and and I use that for the duration of my stay. I got to tell you, trying to stay secure, it's work. <laughs> it is. <laughs> right? It 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 takes it takes some effort and and not everyone would even think of doing that. I certainly don't. I I'll go out there and I certainly some of the basics that we talk about, but I have never thought of bringing a burner phone or this extra Chromebook as you mentioned Daniel. So those are some things for me and for others to think about down the road. So guys, we're, we're kind of winding down here. Final parting thoughts, anything that we didn't cover that you want to make sure you leave people with in terms of cybersecurity awareness month tips, whether it's at home, at the office, traveling. Chris, we'll start with you. Final parting shot. Okay. Let's talk about one of the most essential things that everybody needs when they're traveling, your power needs. Wherever you plug in your device, it's with a potential risk. If you're plugging into a USB port anywhere, any of those could have been tampered with and been used to basically put a device in there that basically will be able to load malware onto your device through that USB cable. So it's very important to make sure that you're using uh, methods and uh, devices to connect up to get power that are, are more secure. The best way to approach that is bring a battery pack with you. It's not too expensive. You can get, I've actually got uh, a variety of them that I've either picked up from shows that I've been to or a couple ones that I got personally as well. I've got enough power packs to manage all the family's devices for very long days travel, charging multiple cell phones or tablets or things like that fully if needed. So everybody, when we travel in the family has a travel battery pack and we have a couple of spares besides that, that we we make sure we've got enough power to get us through what we're doing. If you do need to plug in, especially on like a flight or in um, an airport, the best thing to do is to plug into an actual outlet and only with um, devices that you yourself brought. So, you know, a lot of the charging stations and other things like that, again, could have been tampered with. So best to plug in with devices that you know. So that's just one of those essentials that we all absolutely need while traveling. A really good thing to plan ahead for. I love it. Daniel, your final parting thought. Yeah, ju- just uh, think really uh, about how you're using your your social media accounts when you're traveling. And, and there's really two things to look at here. The, the first one is posting that you're out of town or, or that you're going for a trip or or posting pictures from, from your, your destination notifies crooks in the area that you're not home um, and that it's much easier to go and, and and burglarize your house. Uh, on the the reverse side of that, with, with GPS technology and and auto tagging features, it also helps crooks that are local to the area know where you may be uh, and where you may be staying. And that's a lot harder to to track down. But it, you know, it, it could potentially be used in combination with a little bit of social engineering for someone to figure out what hotel room you are, even convince a receptionist to get a key. For the hotel room and and steal stuff while you're out and about and enjoying the sites. So just um, keep an eye on your social media usage. It's always best to share those pictures and and let everyone know about your experiences after you get back. That's what, so. What you're saying is, if I'm in Hawaii with the whole family and using a battery pack for everyone, like Chris was saying, don't put on social media. Whole family been in Hawaii for two weeks and we're going to be here another two weeks. <laughs> That's a no-no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, you're, and again, two 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 levels of risk, right? That that tells the people that you're not home. 
It also tells people potentially where you're staying in Hawaii so they can they can still stuff from your hotel room as well. Oh, yeah, good good point about that. I could we I could just put a note on my door saying gone to Hawaii we we've gone to Hawaii, <laughs> come on in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, hey Chris, Daniel, always a pleasure. In the middle of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, great talking, uh, some personal uh, safety tips, security tips, as well as travel tips. And travel is going to start to open up here real soon and holidays right around the corner. So um, happy rest of Cybersecurity Awareness Month here in October for you guys. We'll talk to you on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, stay safe, be secure, and keep smiling.